Hey, this is Notzer, and today we're going to be talking about some ship news. Uh, one of the first confirmed free Puerto Rico players shared a bunch of their information on hours needed to unlock each directive. I want to talk about it because this is important to everyone. Also, it seems that the Russian stream revealed a little bit more of the direction that ships is planning on going in 2020, and I want to go through each bulletin, leave my thoughts on it, and go from there. The game in the background is myself in the sign-up. This is the Tier 7 mainline Soviet battleship, and it's kind of OP. So, uh, you know, if, if that's not the impression that you're going to get from this game, well, I didn't do a good enough job of showing it off because this is an amazing game, and hopefully you enjoy it. Obviously, if you don't enjoy the ship, you're not going to enjoy it because this ship is going to dominate this. But let's talk about the player who was successful in unlocking the Puerto Rico for free. Now, they broke it down, they shared all the information. Over a 20-day span, they spent 104 hours and 42 seconds playing the game, and they were able to unlock directives 1 through 6, and that was enough to open up the Puerto Rico for free. They did not spend a single point of doubloons on any of their boosters, and, I mean, 104 hours over 20 days is about 5 hours and 15 minutes per day playing just ships and progressing it forward. Now, I don't know exactly how many signal flags or camouflage or any number of ships available for this person to speed up the process, but 5 and a half hours of ships per day dedicated towards just progressing this forward, not doing anything else in ships and not doing anything in your real life is really depressing. I mean, yeah. The rewards are astronomical. It's like 10,000 coal, 2,000 steel, a tier 10 ship, a tier 10 premium, unique camouflage. Uh, you've got a bunch of camos, you've got a bunch of signal flags. Yeah, 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 we get it, we get it. So this guy needed 10 hours to complete the first directive, 13 hours and 45 minutes to complete the second directive, 12 hours and six minutes to complete directive three, 17 hours for Directive 4, 16 hours and 50 minutes for Directive 5, 13 hours and 20 minutes for Directive 6. That's a ridiculous amount of time. Five and a half hours per day? That's insane. That's not something that players really feel comfortable doing in any game. And for that to be a part of a game like World Warships, which is, you know, it is an online game, but you are in matches with, at most, 23 other people. This is not something where you are competing with the rest of the world to unlock some of these things. It's a huge amount of time. You're not competing with other people to unlock. And yet it feels like, because of the time gate, you are competing with your own self on whether you can fulfill it. And clearly, it is possible. But... Is it really that satisfying to have this be a part of the game and have so many frustrated individuals who know they can't possibly have any chance at this? You know, five hours per day? Some people are lucky to play five hours of this game for an entire month, maybe even a week, two week span. So five hours per day, that's just not gonna happen. And yeah, you don't necessarily need it to happen, but as a consumer, it feels a lot better when people feel like they have a chance with their time investment to get something that's rewarding. And that's that's all anyone is ever asking for. Give people a chance, a reasonable chance. I just don't think that 104 hours and 20 days is a reasonable chance. I think that at the most, you should look at this wargaming and you should say to yourself, okay, what tier or what types of rewards could we give out that would be satisfactory and would still cause players to have to invest, you know, a significant amount of time compared to no time, but nothing in the 104 hours and 20 days. I would much prefer it to be nearly half of that in time invested over that same. So five and a half drops down to two and a half. Two and a half is a lot more to swallow. You could some days double that up or even triple, you know, on the weekends. But having five and a half be the entry 
into a possible way of getting this is just, it was way too high. It was way too ridiculous. And we all knew that. And it was just so frustrating. And it's like, ugh. I really, really don't understand why Wargaming decided to go so hard on the rewards and then demand so much. I mean, if you're going to demand this much, you might as well not even reward it. Because it doesn't feel like a reward when the demand is so high. It feels like a job. Um, some people were doing like, if you did minimum wage with those same hours, you would make like $700 or $1,000. Really? That's a lot of money. You could make back the amount of doubloons that you spend four times over at a minimum wage job towards this. Like, it's just... The effort is way higher than the reward, clearly. And it doesn't flow with anything. But, oh, it you could get it for free. Yeah, that's why we need to screw everyone. Yeah. That's why we need to... What is with this? We have gotten three devastating strikes in a row. And uh, we've taken a ton of damage from the Colorado, but wow. Wow. Uh, just have to break in the action for one second so we can talk about it. But yeah, Puerto Rico, fully unlocked, 104 days, five hours per day. Probably six if we're being really, really fair to the fact that this person clearly did a lot of homework, planning, and all this stuff. So six hours per day during Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. Don't know how many people can actually do that. But clearly Wargaming thought more than a couple. And uh, you know what? That's very optimistic. Very optimistic Wargaming. So let's talk about the other big news that's really cool. Wargaming on a Russian stream revealed a lot of 2020 bullet points on what they wanted to do. So the first bulletin point is that they are focusing their class efforts towards developing the submarine. Uh, this is probably in relation to people complaining about the state of the aircraft carrier. Do they want to make more changes to the aircraft carrier? And as this precise moment, carriers don't break the game. So I don't think Wargaming has any intentions on addressing the carrier anytime soon. Because the submarine is that important. They have to nail it. It has to at least be able to exist on its own. I think if the submarine can play in its own queue, sub versus sub, at the very least... It will have been a success because, honestly, it felt as fun as the one versus one. You know, it was just something completely different, and the gameplay itself was compelling enough that I felt like I could go back there and enjoy it. But obviously, we're only at tier six testing the Germans and the Americans. We don't even consider the CV balance with it at all. So, obviously, there's huge concerns, but just from the sub versus sub... There's enough there that there could be easily dedicated gameplay just for it that doesn't compete or take away from any of the other formats of the game. It would just be some other portion of the game that you can enjoy. So from my view, it is a success. The submarine versus the CV. The, C the subs are in such a better spot than the CVs ever were before they were released in their rework. The AA never even got to the point where it was really good enough until we got that updated priority sector. So, you know, for subs, I'm actually pretty optimistic that uh, we're going to at least get something that was worth the time. And I can't complain about that. Because if, if anything is worth the time enough to draw my attention away from other games, well then clearly it was something that was worth going after. So yeah, subs are not a popular topic. But... I think that submarines deserve to have attention in a naval game because they are that important to naval combat and naval history. So that's one of the nice things about wargaming is that they sort of are encouraged to try and help preserve historical ships and landmarks because it contributes to the fandom of their game. So from that standpoint... Any support for submarines is a good thing because that may mean that a sub exists in our lifetime that would normally get scrapped because they need it. So I'm always in favor of something keeping the history alive. And I, I just, I can't be against the sub versus sub because it is that fun. Now, other things that they've talked about, pan-European DD line, there are concerns that it's too Swedish. Well, absolutely it's too Swedish. One Swedish is too much. But uh, seriously... It's gameplay. They fully intend to, at some point, introduce 
as many or as little as they need. They, they don't really care about how many are of a faction or not, or the widespread support for it. And, you know, that might be disappointing for some, but I know that the technique that they've chosen to do in World of Warships is far more successful than World of Tanks. The line itself is more unified in its design, and I think that that comes from, obviously, having similar designs. And what would have more similar designs than the same Navy doing the designs? I mean... As long as we get Swedish voiceover and, you know, Swedish flags, who's going to care that it's a part of the Pan-European? The only thing that that can do is help us keep all the commanders wrapped under one bubble so I can freely move them around. You know, that that's never a downside. So I, it's very weird to me that this would ever be a controversy. But, you know, whatever. Uh, PBE is not a priority. <laughs> wow. Who would have thought that? PvP is their priority. And uh, apparently, as long as PvP is the priority, which pretty much is every month, every day in the year, we're not going to see much PvE development. You know, it doesn't seem like we're going to get more unique operations. Probably the bot skill level is not going to develop much more. This is just maybe existing in the game to give people a taste so they can go out and play in a random rank and uh, you know for some players it's not what they're looking for they really are wanting more pve scenarios where you play as a ship or in a fleet action and do stuff and you know i think that would be fun uh but i don't want it to take away from pvp you know i i feel like it kind of needs to be its own development team in order to do the best it possibly can be. Because if you try and move PvE and PvP and intermingle them, it ends up hurting both. Uh, WoW definitely learned this, so that's the sort of hesitation I have with ships. Uh, they plan to continue to optimize the port. Uh, it is in progress as we speak. Uh, obviously, port optimization is going to help with the responsiveness of switching your commander and your signal flags and camouflage, this cannot happen at a faster rate for me. It's one of the most disappointing portions of the game. The fact that probably the most complex part of the game is hindered by the, the worst performance, it, it says something. So the fact that it's a priority, maybe the UI team can put more effort towards that and less towards events. That's all I'm saying. I really want those guys making it the best it possibly can be because it is intimidating. This is a complicated game to get into, and the UI does not help it at all, the port UI specifically. Um, the Slava is frozen. Frozen solid, kind of like Arthas on the, uh, the Frozen Throne. Uh, it's even more frozen than the Siegfried. I would honestly be completely shocked if we ever see the Slava in the game. It's just a gut feeling I have. Uh, I'm more expectant that the Siegfried will make its way to the game. But at what date, I have no idea. And you know what? I'm happy that the Siegfried is under more consideration than the Slava. The Slava is just really unhealthy for the game. You know, it's basically like sticking Stalingrad guns at a, at a gun caliber of 4 or 6 on a battleship that operates at 20 kilometers. Like, how are you going to balance that? It needs to be some downside for its extreme velocity and its downside is low amount of heal when would you ever need that you're super far back so yeah i'm glad the slava is basically frozen i don't really care for that type of design in the game personally uh, the devs are honestly ignoring players opinions about soviet ships being op or not now this is a complex topic because different regions have different views on this the Russian region, I hate to say it, I know this doesn't apply to all the Russians on the Russian region, but the Russian region is incredibly biased in favor of Russia, clearly. And they are constantly lobbying wargaming on their forums, and in person even. I've they've mentioned that they've been stopped before on the street, so I wouldn't be surprised if they'd done it too. And they will openly tell wargaming how weak the Russians are. Like, how dare you make the Russians so weak? And yet, other regions, seemingly, view them as the most broken crap in the game. For my eyes, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. 
uh, the power level of even the Kremlin is much more manageable if you just fight it correctly. You know, it's very annoying. I grant you that. And the sign-up, <laughs> uh, there's so much overpin at this tier. It's a big deal. Uh, but the higher the tier, the less that actually impacts the balance. Uh, it's really the mid-tier where the game's balance is kind of screwy. You know, there are ships that are just so much better than other ships at mid-tier that it's it's almost laughable that tier 10 gets so much attention. Uh, and I think that's kind of hurt the game's development in the fact that mid-tier is kind of ignored by a lot of people, and it can't be because that's how you get introduced to the game, and it's just, eh. I have concerns that we're just focusing too much attention on one tier when we need to really focus on mid-tier because mid-tier is not in a good place to me. There's way too much imbalance at mid-tier. Apparently the Kremlin is gonna be receive a little bit of a change. It's very tiny. I don't know if it's worse or better, they didn't say. Uh, but if the Kremlin receives, I don't know, a slight Sigma nerf so that its accuracy at max range isn't nearly perfect, so that is actually a downside, I think that would be healthy for the ship. Don't know that they would do that because there were a lot of CCs and super testers complaining about the Kremlin being too weak and it received a Sigma buff mere days before it was fully released. So, you know what? Who the hell knows what's going to happen with that one? Uh, campaigns are alive, apparently. Thank God, because I thought they were dead. They plan to do some in 2020, somewhere in the springtime. So I'm excited for campaigns. I think campaigns are a great way to award commanders, specifically. I hated how Gunther was rewarded. I honestly disliked how the French and the Soviet were because you just felt like you had to be there for the event. And if you weren't there for the event, you were screwed out of a commander. And these were good commanders. The fact that they're even usable in rank means that they're required. And if they're required, it needs to be easier to obtain. Just saying. Uh, submarines, after the beta test, they would be in-game events with them, but they wouldn't be in random or competitive at all. And that's how the CV rework should have been. I don't know how long this is going on. I hope that it goes on for a while until... Everything is refined enough, you know, like commander balance. You know, some of those commander skills are still pretty much garbage. Advanced firing training, massive AA fire. I would love that being addressed. Uh, they make no mention of IFHE. Are they going to address it or not? Who knows? No idea on that front. Alternative CV lines have been postponed. These are the lines that they sort of teased back in like January and February of last year before we all realized how bad the CV rework really was in balance. Uh, obviously... In order to introduce that, you have to feel like CVs are fully ready and fully 100%, and clearly they don't, because they wouldn't be postponing it. That's just how I read it, and I think that's fair. Uh, also, CVs are not included in clan battles, so clearly there's something not done with them, but it seems that Wargaming is sort of bypassing any attention towards them and making sure that the submarines get a better launch to their life. We'll see if that actually happens. And then finally, they just mentioned that port interface plans exist. Hopefully they do, because you got to make the port better, guys. The UI kind of is clunky, and it's not the easiest to navigate, and players want to be able to do things more freely, you know, filter out signal flags or camo or anything like that in a way that is more integrated. Maybe uh, commander loadouts, that would be cool. So let's see what they do. Certainly interesting information. Uh, leave in the comments what you think. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to check out more of my content, you can click the most recent or the most relevant uploads. You could also choose to subscribe to my channel. We do daily World Watcher videos, first impression, how to, news, and review related. My North American recruit invite is on the screen. You can take advantage of that. I stream at twitch.tv slash Thank you. Have a wonderful day and I'll catch you next time.